the Baird government in New South Wales. To Professor James Allen, our guest, he is a Canadian, Australian law professor and writer. He's currently the Garrick Professor of Law at the University of Queensland. He's a qualified barrister and solicitor. He has degrees from Queen's University, the London School of Economics and the University of Hong Kong. Professor Allen regularly writes opinion pieces for the Australian newspaper and Quadrant magazine. And in 2014, he authored the book, ironically, eh, given the debate today, Democracy in Decline. Steps in the wrong direction. And ain't that true? I thought tonight we'd have a look at two issues of confusion in the electorate. On the one hand, the so-called Senate reform, and the other, this business about a double dissolution, trying to keep it simple so that people can understand it. And James Allen, professor, is with us in the studio in Brisbane. James Allen, thank you for your time. Good evening, Alan. Uh, isn't it a great time to be alive in Australia? <laughs> <laughs> yes, to quote the words of someone else. Can I just raise with you firstly, though, this business about, because it's six months to the day on Monday since Tony Abbott was replaced as Prime Minister by Malcolm Turnbull. John Stone, who was the Secretary to the Treasury from 1979 to 1984, most probably none better than Stone, and a former National Party Senate leader, said in response to those people, wrote very recently, only this week, saying, let's get over it and move on. John Stone said, quote, if treachery and betrayal along this scale are not punished, they will beget more such treachery and betrayal as the Labor Party experience amply demonstrates. He said the magnitude of that political crime last September cannot be overstated. John Howard, of whose prime ministership I wrote in highly favourable terms eight years ago, that's John Stone, has demeaned himself by defending the Turnbull conspiracy on the grounds that politics is a numbers game. Writes John Stone, really, John, no question of principle arises in that your Liberal Party's broad church should be deconsecrated. You hold a similar view to that, don't you? Oh, well, I do, and that was a great piece by John in The Spectator, uh, which is a great magazine. Um, well, I do. I, I uh, have never really reconciled myself to the, to the defenestration of uh, Mr Abbott. Uh, now, look, I thought there was plenty wrong with the way Abbott was running things, but uh, I, uh, on principle, I don't like uh, throwing out a leader in the first term. Uh, it didn't work out for the Tories in England with Margaret Thatcher. They're still arguing about it. It's, it's incredible to me that uh, he would try to copy the dysfunctional uh, few years of the Labour government. And even worse than that, once Mr Turnbull actually came into office, Every single step he's taken has been to the left. You know, he increased the pay offer to civil servants, uh, blocked out the Bjorn Lomborg Center, um, billion dollars on innovation, a billion dollars to some climate thing that is going to have no return, cozied up to Gillian Triggs. Uh, he's even worse on free speech than Tony Abbott, which is hard to believe. So uh, even if you say, OK, I'm going to try to forget this, every move's in the wrong direction. So my view is you're, you know, as a long time, if you're a Liberal supporter, uh, do you spoil your ballot or do you just bite the bullet and vote for Labour, which, you know, I'm actually contemplating. Uh, and of course, on top of that, we've got this business today of cozying up to the Greens. Uh, yeah, my, my basic rule is if the Greens agree with you, then you should think again and then you should think again and then not do it. <laughs> you have written recently about the, what you call the nuclear option. And you say that if by voting against this government, you and others bring in a Labor one, then that outcome, though regrettable, will teach the Liberal Party a lesson it will never forget. Yeah, it depends on your framework. I mean, obviously, if you're looking at things over the next two years, then um, Mr Turnbull's probably better than Mr Shorten from the point of view of a small government, Hobbesian, sort of right of center person, but if, you're, if your time frame is 15 years down the road looking back, well, maybe it's just better to get out the most left-wing leaning leader of the Liberal Party ever, get him out, take your three years of pain with Mr. Shorten, uh, and then uh, try to fix the party. I mean, of course, it might be different if you were in the UK and you were looking at a Mr. Uh, Corbyn, but, uh, you know, Mr. Shorten, is he worse than uh, uh, Rudd? I don't think he is. I mean, the, it was the Australian newspaper that came out in 2007 for Rudd, which was probably one of the worst decisions ever. So, I mean, you have to make up your own mind. There's other options. You can uh, put the Liberals second in preferences and they lose a lot of, a lot of money 
because the parties are funded by first preferences. Uh, you can do whatever you want in the Senate. You can refuse to vote for the Liberals completely in the Senate. Um, you can uh, be creative with your preferences without actually ticking labor, or you can just make the call that uh, we have to we have to make this, uh, we have to get rid of Turnbull. Well, um, let's, let's I, just... I think it was a terrible mistake to put him in. Um, I, I said at the time he should immediately call an election. Uh, it, during the honeymoon period, it's a bad mistake not to. I saw this when I lived in New Zealand with uh, Jenny Shipley. She came in and she didn't call an election. And by the time she actually got around to an election, she lost. Mm -hmm. So who knows what will happen? I, I can't see the future. Now, the Senate. Do you think people understand what they're talking about? Well, it's incredibly complicated. Uh, I think a lot of Australians don't appreciate that around the Westminster world, Britain, Canada, New Zealand, Australia is very unusual in having an elected upper house. There's no upper house in New Zealand. In Canada and Britain, the upper house is wholly appointed. It does nothing. It blocks nothing. So in those countries, when you, get, when you win an election, if the, if the budget's in a terrible shape, you just do what you want and you wait till the next election. Uh, we have an American constitution. We're the most American constitution in the world. We have a really strong elected upper house. So you can win an election and you can't do what you want to do. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very unusual. Now, there are advantages to that and there are disadvantages, but... Uh, one of the ways that the people who drafted our constitution, it's a very good constitution, by the way, but one of the things they did is they built in this mechanism for resolving disagreements between the two houses. When you look at the U.S., when the Senate and the House don't agree, there's just gridlock. There's nothing you can do. You have to just wait for the politics to play out. We have this provision that's beautifully crafted, Section 57, that allows you to have a double dissolution election, which is what... Um, you were talking about earlier when you were wondering if Mr. Uh, Turnbull was going to cross the Rubicon and, and call one. And there's a provision in the Constitution um, that, that requires that there be twice as many members in the House as there are in the Senate. And that's because if you call a double dissolution and you win and you still can't pass the bill, you can go to a joint sitting. And because there are twice as many members of the House, they will almost always triumph over the Senate. So what you can do if you want it to is you can pass anything just by building up a number of triggers. And that is where you pass a bill, it's blocked. You pass it again three months later and it's blocked again. And you can just create as many triggers as you want. I mean, my view was Mr. Abbott should have built up 30, 40 triggers. Yep. And then when you call a double dissolution and you go to a joint sitting, you can pass everything. Well, now, and, you know, right now we're in this ridiculous situation where uh, Mr. Turnbull's threatening a double dissolution election with one, well, two, actually two triggers, but they're both trifles. They're, they're insignificant. Well, let me just take that point. And so you're, you're going to look like an idiot if you call a double dissolution yes. election. And, and would, would the Governor General, he'd have to take advice, accept the request for a double dissolution on the basis of two bills, which, as you said, are quite trivial? Yeah, well, yes, he would, because you can call it, once you have a trigger, you can call a double dissolution election. But during the campaign, um, it'll be impossible for Mr. Turnbull to say, well, this, this is about the A, B, double C, if that's not one of the triggers. Mm. And the other two, most people well, don't even the... know about. One's well... basically to make unions look more like corporations. Yeah. And the other one's, I think, the clean energy. Clean energy bill, finance corporation. Mr. Turnbull doesn't even believe in. He doesn't believe in it. And so he's no. wanting a d double dissolution, so it will pass. So now we come, therefore, to the big trigger, uh, the reintroduction of the Building and Construction Commission. Now, Mr Turnbull today has obviously decided, he's, they've rejected a motion by Senator Muir, that that bill be debated this week. No, because the Greens said, we'll support your Senate reform so long as you don't put any policies into the Senate this week we're uncomfortable with. Now, here's a core plank of the Coalition's platform. And a Senator has argued, let's debate it today. And the Liberals have said, no, we won't have debate on the very thing that they're wanting to use as the component for double dissolution. Well, I guess if you were trying to, de to describe it and your, your choices were tactical genius or incredible incompetence, you'd probably lean towards the latter. It, um, I mean, I, let's be clear. 
I, I am sympathetic to the idea that we need to change the Senate voting system. But the problem is what they're doing is not really very much of a reform. And so, you know, they are getting rid of the group voting ticket, and I, I sympathize with that. It, it, it's crazy that the parties get to direct the flow of preferences. I, th I think what people need to realize is the Senate compared to the House is not very democratically um, accountable. In the House, everyone's vote counts the same. You divide the country into the sort of equally sized chunks, and everyone has the same number of voters in their constituency district, and so your vote counts the same as mine. The Senate is very lopsided. It's modeled on the American Senate. And so your vote in, in Tasmania for the Senate is worth about 20 times as much as it is in New South Wales. Mm. In the U.S., your, your vote in California is worth 1 75th of a Wyoming person's. And so that doesn't look very good democratically. And if you take that and you add to that a terrible voting system, and I don't like STV, um, what you find is that the Senate is not a very, you know, I, I tend to agree with Paul Keating. It's unrepresentative swill compared to the House. So they ought to be very careful with what they block. And they're not. They've gotten really too big for their boots. So changing the voting system is a good idea up there. I agree with that. But what, what the Turnbull government's doing is it's, it's sort of fiddling at the edges. So you're going to get rid of group voting tickets. And, and so, you, you know, there'll still be a few independents. But the overall outcome is probably going to be, as you said earlier, that the Greens are going to become more powerful. Now, that means when Labour wins elections, they'll get anything they want through the Senate. Uh, Julia Gillard had no trouble getting anything through the Senate, even with the current group. Um, but every time you elect a coalition government, they won't get anything through the Senate. I mean, I personally would go back to the system uh, used before 1949. I'd just go for the straight preferential voting in the Senate, and I'd just wipe out all the small parties. Absolutely. Now, that's a pretty unusual view, but, uh, you know, our Senate is a mess, and the, the STV voting system is bad. The, the reform will make it slightly better, but it'll still be bad. Bob Hawke. And, and to, Bob Hawke once said that sorry. one of the worst things he ever did was to increase the representation in the Senate for each state from 10 to 12. Now, if you're talking about democracy, isn't it ludicrous that Tasmania have 12 senators? So do New South Wales. Tasmania, is that democratic? Well, again, the, the Senate was modelled on the US Senate, so it hasn't got the democratic credentials of the House. But it was supposed to be a state body that looked out for the states, yeah. and so all the little states got the same as the big states. And, you know, about 10 years after um, the Constitution, party politics just killed the Senate, and it doesn't work at all in that sense. So you're right. The upper house hasn't got anywhere near the, the, the democratic legitimacy of the, the lower house, okay, well, which is why you ought to be able to use Section 57 yeah. a fair bit. I mean, one of the crazy things is right after Mr. Abbott won the election, on the ABC and the Fairfax Press and even the Australian a bit, you were getting all these criticisms. Why isn't Mr. Abbott out there negotiating with some guy who likes cars and Jackie Lambie and Clive Palmer? And my view is, well, why should he be negotiating with people who got a few thousand votes? This is a guy who ran, he won, he won 53% of the yeah. vote. He had a massive mandate. And there's no reason at all why he should have to negotiate with these crazy people over things that were part of his mandate. Just coming back then to if the change and the bill is passed, there's people listening to you tonight and are going to vote in the Senate. What do they do that's different from what they used to do? Right. Well, let's assume there's a no double dissolution. Uh, if there's a, just a regular half Senate election, you'll be voting for six senators. Um, if you don't vote for a single Liberal senator and Mr. Turnbull wins in the House, they will still form government. You will punish them by not uh, voting for them in the Senate. If you put them second on the ticket in the House, so you, you, know, you pick the sex party and then the Liberal second, all those preferences will flow to the Liberals, so you won't really be voting for Labour, but they will pay a big penalty in terms of the money that flows to them. That's another thing you can do. Um, there's a lot of options you can do. Uh, if it turns out to be a double dissolution election, which means that has to be called by May 11th, because it has to be done yep. six months before, before um, the the term three years the after the yep. first sitting of the last election, after the last election, a double dissolution brings in 12 senators, which means that the quotient drops from 14 points to 7%. 7%, 7 yeah. to well, that's just down to 7.7. Yeah. 7. You're going to get even more 
of yeah. the sort of small, just, crazy people in the Senate. Let's just take this tablecloth, though, that they get when they go into the voting for the Senate. It's as big as a tablecloth. And there is above the line and below the line. Now, above the line... They won't be voting for individuals above the line. They'll still be voting for parties, won't they? And they vote one to six. Well, if the reform goes through yeah. that uh, Mr Turnbull is banking, you know, the entire world on, uh, then when you go in to vote in the Senate, yeah, instead of just picking one group or party yeah. uh, who then do the preferences for you, you will do your own preferences. So you can still vote above the line or below the line. Um, if you vote above the line, I, I can't remember, I think you'll have to pick, you'll have to six. do six preferences, That's right. you the voter, yep. and if you vote below the line, I think you're supposed to do 12 instead of numbering right. the entire ticket, which was ridiculous. I yep. did that the first time I voted in Australia. I think I was in there for two hours. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's crazy. Yes. Um, so that, so <laughs> it'll be better in that sense. Um, I mean... So, so at least you will be directing your own preferences. But it will turn out, I think, that you're going to have a big third grouping of the Greens. And that means that whenever Labour wins an election, they'll get stuff through the House, or sorry, through the Senate. And whenever Liberals win an election or the Coalition wins an election, uh, it'll be near impossible. Um, and now they can fix it. You can always fix the voting system in the Senate by just making it an issue for a double dissolution and ramming it through in a joint sitting. So you can do that. It's not carved in stone, but uh, it won't be easy to do after uh, immediately. It'll take a while. I think part of the problem for uh, uh, Mr. Joyce, by the way, is that he's being tarred by um, yep. Mr. Turnbull. Yeah. Just come back, though, to the Senate paper. And we're talking about preferences and so on. And we used to just vote, or we're told to vote one. So you're a Labor supporter or a Liberal supporter, you put one in their, in their box in the Senate, and then they, the Labor, Liberal Party, the Labor Party, have decided where these preferences will go. You don't worry anymore. Now you'll go from one to six. So you'll put Liberals one and the Sun Ripe and Warm Tomato Party two and the <laughs> Greens or whatever they are down to six. Just explain how that then affects the allocation of your preference. OK, well, I'll do that. But first, I'd probably be inclined to put the ripening tomato party above the Liberals these days. But assuming you want to put uh, the Liberals ahead of even them. Um, so, so basically, STV is a, is, a, is a description for a family of proportional voting systems. STV. And it's incredibly difficult to understand, S but STV. effectively, you take the number of people who are being elected. So in each state, if it's a regular half-Senate election, it's six, and you add one to that to make seven, and you make that the denominator over one. So seven over one um, gives you your 14.28% or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, if it's 12, you add one, you get 13. So one over 13, and it's 7, seven yeah. point something percent. Yeah. And what happens is you just count. And so the, the problem with the group voting ticket is the parties pick how the preferences will flow and the order of the people. And uh, the voter just basically knows I'm voting for the libs or I'm voting for labor. Mm. And all the deals that are going on, you can't see. They're opaque. Even when you're in the voting booth, if you look for something on the wall on the day of the election to see how the parties are directing their preferences, it's not there. You have to actually go on to the uh, Australian Electoral Commission website to find it. Now, my guess is that one person in a million actually does that, probably fewer. So all of that, it's good to change that. But when this new system, um, the preferences will, will basically end when you get to your six. And because the little tiny parties, I mean, I'm, Jackie Lambie probably has a big enough name that, ironically, even with the changes, she'll get back in in Tasmania. Mm, mm. I, pro, I'm not a cephologist. I don't really know how this is going to work. But my guess is that, that she might get back in. Clive Palmer's not getting back in his party no matter what. Um, you'll still get little parties, and the big parties will still win most of the seats in the Senate, but the Greens will do better. And uh, that's not going to surprise anyone why the Greens are supporting this. Now, I tend to agree with those members of the Labour Party and the Liberal Party who think that, you know, one of the best things that could happen is to really um, see, the, see the Green Party diminish in importance. Given, given Not that, everyone agrees with that, but that's my view. No, well, it's a view held by many people in the Liberal Party who would put 
always the Greens last, and now they find their leader doing deals in Canberra that will entrench the Greens in the Senate. I mean, the rage out there is white hot over all yes, of this. Yes, and Alan, there's a lot of people in the Labor Party who see the Greens, you know, in the long term, I suspect the Greens are a bigger threat to Labor than they are to the Liberals. When Meg Lees, the point I made earlier in the program, did a deal with John Howard over the GST, and many people in the Democrats thought they were there to keep the bastards honest, and that was basically the beginning of the end of the Democrats. Could the paradox of this be that with the Greens leaping into bed with the Liberals over Senate reform, that rather than strengthen their vote, it may in fact erode it? Well, to be honest, Alan, I don't think the analogy works because with the GST issue, the main voters for the Democrats didn't like it. But it's hard not to... I mean, I can't see why green voters wouldn't like a deal that gets them more green members in the Senate. I mean, so, you know, why, as a green voter, why would you be angry at the Greens for striking a deal that helps your party in the next election? You wrote a book about democracy. How are we going on the democratic front? Well, in the book, my, my main uh, grievance has to do with the sort of inflated view of the importance of international law, which hasn't got a democratic bone in its body, or, you know, trumped up, uh, puffed up, unelected judges who start making inroads into the uh, decision-making powers of elected parliaments. And I think there's a problem around the democratic world with that. Australia does pretty well on those counts, actually. Our judges look great compared to the Canadian judges or the American judges. Um, but there's, you know, there's clearly a problem. Uh, you know, our, our elected system was designed to copy the American Madisonian system, a checks and balances system, and the whole goal of that was to make it hard to do things. So I guess in a weird kind of way, uh, if James Madison could be brought back to life, he would say the system is working. It's making it impossible to do things. And if you're, you know, your fear is that the politicians are going to do things you hate, I suppose you could say, well, they're not doing anything. And I know quite mm. a few people who would say, you know, if you could promise me three years where the politicians did zero, I'd be quite yeah, happy. That's it. Um, the problem is that this government is doing things. It's just not doing anything conservative. And, and on that.